how to price your services and products, which is, I think, one of the toughest things you can do as an entrepreneur. And I know a lot of us are in uh, the consulting businesses, business as well as services. So this should be very interesting. Michael Dermer is on. Hello, so, hello. Hi, how are you? Great, how are you? Awesome. So we are going to start with an amazing story, as you always do, um, of some of your experiences uh, of being uh, an entrepreneur over how many years? Too many, right? Too many. <laughs> we, we won't count. Uh, so you can go ahead and kick off the meeting. Again, feel free to be interactive, and uh, we look forward to, to hearing from you guys today. Um, thank you, Tafair. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, over the course of my healthcare company, and you just have so many stories that we all have crazy ones. Uh, and we were just thinking about this other day because we were actually talking about, believe it or not, the, the weather. And back in 2008, when my healthcare company that we had built, you know, almost collapsed because of the financial crisis, um, I used to go to the gym very early in the morning and sweat. We were working 20 hours a day and we just built this thing and we, what we built over 10 years, you know, was getting destroyed and it was crazy. And I used to go to the gym early in the morning to sweat. And, and I went, after I worked out, I went in to take a shower and there was, there was no hot water, right? It was like freezing cold water. And the days were crazy at that point. You know, people were just the, you know, the banking system was collapsing and all of our clients were the biggest companies in America. So it was like the, every day it was hitting the fan. And, I remember being under the shower and and experiencing that cold water, and of course, it, you know, thrill. If any of you have happened, it startles you, right? And I was like, I don't know why, I just had this sadistic entrepreneurial thought. I was like, you know what? If I could take this, I certainly can take what happens during the day. And what I started to do is every day I added a little bit under the cold shower to the point where I got to five minutes. And every morning I would just stand there for five minutes under the cold shower for like this probably lasted for six months where every day I would just stand there. So for any of you who are interested, go try it for about 15 seconds. Um, and I can tell you that by doing, by doing that every day, as sadistic as that sound, everything during the day seemed easier. And uh, so hopefully us just coming out of COVID and the pandemic, and I know a lot of us are still feeling the effects, but um, it was definitely something that only us, uh, us crazy entrepreneurs do. So for what, for what it's worth. Um, I wanted to talk today about um, this is an issue of pricing your products and services. And um, I really wanted to give everybody the context and the background of um, just how this relates to a lot of the topics we talk about all the time. Um, uh, I wanna give you the context of something I've said before, which is pre-COVID, um, we all face the heavy degree of competition, right? We, regardless of what industry you're in, there's always competition, right? And that existed. There was also always this feeling that somebody is providing the product or the service that I provide cheaper, right? I used to go buy a beautiful dress. Now I rent it for a week, right? <laughs> like there's always an easier, cheaper, less expensive way to do it. Um, and so we always had this backdrop of, okay, um, it's always going to be done cheaper and there's always going to be more competition. That's pretty hard. Now you have COVID and that gets exacerbated, right? Because now you have situations where people say, oh, okay, I'm a, I'm a yoga studio. Awesome. I'm going to shift online. And it seemed good, right? Okay, that's a way I can solve and hopefully maybe still provide value to my clients. It's not as good as being face-to-face, -face, but maybe it's okay. And well, what happens then? Now you're no longer just competing with, right? The yoga studios that were within 10 blocks of you. Now you're competing with a yoga instructor in Iowa and Peru and maybe even Peloton, right? So competition has gotten even more intense, right? And because of the use of technology, so many things that people pay for before they pay very, very little for. And at the same time, there's always somebody that's willing to give away, or it certainly seems like it, every product or service for free. It's not completely free, but, but almost, right? Think about when we buy things, 
Um, certainly during the pandemic, if you went to a car dealership and said, I want a car, they would give it to you for two months to just try it out. So the perspective of pricing your products and services, I want everybody to realize that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> It's not just them. Everybody is facing this idea of hyper competition and the fact that somebody else will um, provide your service for less than you will, right? So if you're trying to fight on those basis, you are going to lose. Remember, there's giving somebody giving it away for free, right? So you're you're going to lose. And so you say to yourself, okay, well, how do I how do I price my product or service, right? And and the point is that you can never price your product or service low enough to beat free. Which means that if, if you're fighting the fight in your own mind going, I'm too expensive, I'm too expensive, somebody over here, that is the wrong conversation to have. Because you can never win that conversation. Because somebody else there is out there doing it for free. Okay. So when you think about um, pricing your product and service, okay, you have to think of it as not just how you're packaging it up. But against the backdrop of something that I've, I've been talking about before, which is this whole notion of why you win revenue in a hyper-competitive world. And, and it goes back to these, these concepts around finding a playground nobody else is playing and especially know-how, right? Um, many of you have heard us talk a lot on finding a playground no one else is playing. I'll spend a little time on that, but I really want to spend more time on the know-how part, okay? Um, if if you don't bring your unique know-how to a product or service, somebody will always say, I can get it cheaper, right? Um, what you have to be able to do is to, is to bring your you, you know-how to the table. So when somebody listens to you, they're like, if I didn't know that, I was either going to waste a lot of money, experience a lot of risk, or lose in a big way. Okay, so um, I don't know. What is it Molly? Right, you're in Marlboro, New Hampshire, right? So if I said to you, when you drive through Marlboro, New Hampshire, what's the stoplight that has the most traffic? Right. What, what would you tell us? Is Molly there somewhere? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, if right. I were to stop, yeah. Oh, well, it's a blinking track of light, so <laughs> it's a pretty right. small town. Right, and so you would say, you know, you should be really careful because if you go there at two o'clock or you should be really careful because, you know, when the kids are coming home from school and the crosswalk's there, it's slow, right? Like you, you have a unique insight about where you are that if I was going to do business in Marlboro, New Hampshire, like I would want to have you because I'm going to be late to all my meetings because I don't know how to manage the stoplight, right? So pricing becomes, I don't want to say irrelevant, but definitely relevant to, re related to rather, the ability to the fact that you're bringing know-how to the table that they can't get in other places, okay? And that is the equivalent right of you know the old days of okay you're getting a lot of value for the price but remember people always think you can get stuff for free so in and i know for i don't know everybody for but for a whole bunch of people here the diversity of businesses are some are consumer businesses some are b2b businesses right um, selling to all different types of customers um I remember when I started as a lawyer in a big New York law firm, and any of you who either have or know friends that have done that, everybody talks about New York lawyers burning out because we worked so hard. The day you showed up, the um, recruiters would start calling you and say, hey, listen, I know you're going to get unhappy eventually, and I'm gonna, I'd like to be a recruiter, so when you do go do that, I'll place you somewhere else. And 10 of them would call you up, and nine of them would say that, and then one of them would say, um, I don't want to know what you do now, but somebody from your background would be a perfect fit in five years for these emerging industries, right? So that person brought a know-how and an understanding that totally differentiated them from the other nine, even though the other nine do exactly the same thing. Okay, so when we price our products and services, 
part of it is of course, okay, you know, are you getting a lot of value? How are you organizing it? And we'll talk about some of these functional things, but, but if I leave you with nothing else today, it is your ability to bring to the table, right? Uh, know how about your specific craft, which, which no doubt you all have. Okay. Um, where people go, wow, that's really different. Okay. Um, I'm going to, if it's okay, I think she's, uh, let me double check. So I feel, so we talked yesterday, right. And we talked about it services and I feel shared with me, um, that many IT implementations in healthcare struggle because it's just not budgeted and planned and executed properly. And one of the things that she also said is that a lot of times they put in these systems in healthcare and they don't really take into account the people that are using them like the physician. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, but what unique know-how do you have about, well, she happens to be a physician herself. And she could say, you know, these are the three things that are going to happen in your program that because you don't take into this into account. Okay. Now you can see at, I didn't even mention what she does. She does IT services and other things, but, but it's the fact that she brings those unique insights of what it was like to be a physician when a system failed. Right. It's that that makes them go, Oh, I want to work with her when it comes to IT services. Okay. Another couple of examples. So I mentioned, I may have mentioned before this great cool little company called WhiskerDoc. WhiskerDoc is a subscription service for all the things you need to try to do with your pet when you don't want to go to the vet, right? All this stuff comes up with your, your, your pet and you end up Googling it. And it's not stuff you would go to the vet for some clinical, some just lifestyle things. And when you think about it, it really is just, it's an online platform and you can opt into talking to a vet on the phone, but it's, you know, it's technology and service. So a lot of the pet companies out there would say to this client, they would say, well, wait a minute, it's just a phone service and it's just some technology and it's why am I paying so much to license this platform? And right, wrong or otherwise, we all know that these technology platforms have a lot of robustness to them and there's lots of reasons you should license them, but buyers go, well, wait a minute, it's just a call center and Right, what's the big deal? Why is it so expensive? And for a long time, they were saying, well, we have to answer the phone and we have to build technology. And, but, but that was all falling on deaf ears. These were people who were smart people, they knew it. They knew there was technology that had to be built and phones that had to be answered. And then we said, well, wait a minute, there are all these things that happen when you help these pet owners that make all the difference in the world, right? So you can spin up a call center of a thousand people um, so I'll give you an example in New York city where I live, um, there aren't nearly as many trees and as in Florida and Houston and New Hampshire. And so in Manhattan, the concrete jungle, they have outside of these big buildings, they'll have like one tree planted, like in a little, in a little thing that has some foliage around it with some, you know, little bars around it. And, uh, dogs would go in there and dogs in the city would go and, you know, chew on the foliage. Right. And it turns out that in New York city, to prevent the foliage from getting eaten, they actually spray it with pesticides, right? And so dogs get really sick and nobody's preventing these dogs from doing this because most people know that. So when people would call up the service and say, hey, my dog's really sick, they would tell them that story, right? Now, who would ever know that, right? So when they go into their sales meetings and somebody says, well, wait a minute, it's just a phone service, right? Well, they tell stories like that and they go, oh, these guys know this stuff. Like I wouldn't even know to ask, right? And it turns out that one of the companies that um, had this kind of nationwide service for pet care actually had a dog die because they had people on the phone. You could pick up the phone and call and say, hey, what happened? And they didn't do anything about it and the dog died. And literally it tanked their stock price. So, so the point is that, that you can probably say, tell I'm not talking about the mousetrap. You're going to talk about your mousetrap. You're going to say what it does. You're going to talk about it, what it is. And remember, this applies to both consumers and it applies to, to businesses, right? I'm talking about in the context of, you know, some B2B stuff. But, but the reason why somebody pays attention to your mousetrap or your solution or your approach, right, is because, and remember, in a cluttered world where everything's free, is you've made them go, I don't 
I didn't know that. I didn't know what they just told me. So if you're able to bring out two or three of these examples of know-how, and these are the things that show up first and foremost, not in the background, but first and foremost in your marketing communications. Okay. Um, we haven't talked about it nearly enough, but in our conversation yesterday, at IT, right? If you made the claim, if you're not looking at it from a physician's eye, you'll fail. That's what you want people to debate. You want people to go, uh, maybe, maybe not, but some people are going to go, yes, as opposed to we provide great IT services. Like who doesn't say that? Who says that I, I provide lousy IT service? Like everyone's we're on time, we're on budget, we're great, our clients love us, right? No one ever fires us, you know, all this stuff. So, so the point is that when you're thinking about pricing your products and services, you have to make sure that from the very moment you're interacting with somebody, um, you are using tools and techniques to make sure that they understand your know-how. I'll give you another example. Um, when we started our rewards business in healthcare, we wrote a white paper, very short, couple pages, that was called The Seven Deadly Sins of Healthcare Incentive Management. Not that sexy of a title, of course, but uh, these were seven things where we said, these are seven things you should never do when you're running an incentive program because they're, as we like to say, get you on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for all the wrong reasons, right? Not one of those seven things said, we're great. Not one of those seven things said, this is what our solution is, right? Those seven things said, whether you do it yourself, hire a third part company, hire us, regardless of you how, how you do this, um, you should make sure you don't do these seven things. Now, what's the result of that? Who even knew, unless you did this every day, right? Unless you traveled to the blinking right in Marlboro every day, how would you even know? You wouldn't even know these seven things. You wouldn't even know what time of day you shouldn't go by the blinking light, okay? So a buyer sees these seven things and goes, I, maybe I knew one of them. And I wouldn't even have known not to do all these things, okay? Now you're going from, okay, here's my widget to this organization has shown me what I don't know and what they can teach me. Now let me pay attention to what their widget is. Okay. And this is a really hard thing to think about when we are also invested in our widget. Like who, who says to like, you know, demo day investor. Uh, so Michael, how's your widget? That's eh, okay. I mean, everybody thinks their widget's awesome, right? And so the challenge is that, that we're so invested in it, we're like, ah, if we just explain it to people, if we just explain why the dresses in our shop are better, if we just explain why our technology is better, if we just explain why our food's better, then people will just get, well, are you guys paying attention to any of that? I'm not. Like, you got to make me go, ooh, and then I'll pay attention all day long, right? So, so when you think about the way you're going to price something. In this day and age, you, you have to package it, in fact, precede it with this knowledge and this know-how. Okay? And, and so what I would challenge every one of you to do, regardless of the type of business that you have, okay? Go back and pick three things and make them esoteric things. Like don't make them generalized things, right? Things you would see on a competitor's website that would say the same thing. Pick three things that are very unique that, that show your buyer that you really know this a lot better than they do. And if that they don't hire you, they're gonna be at a significant disadvantage from doing this, okay? I'll give you an example that has been uh, something that we've been working on a lot with our with our black partners as part of our black entrepreneur initiative. Um, what many people don't know is that I don't want to say all, but virtually all of the trends in music, art, food, and fashion have come from the black community. Right? The black community doesn't get nearly as much credit for it. 
But if you go back and you look at the history of many of the trends that our society lives and breathes and have turned into trillion dollar businesses, they, they come from the black community. So if you are an investor and you are investing in one of those sectors, which is, you know, a good part of the society and you don't, if you're not taking advice from people from the black community, you're just missing it, right? Be because there's a unique insight and know-how that has come from what the latest trends are in a lot of these, in a lot of these markets. But my point is, it's that know-how. Somebody can come to you and say, hey, Nike, you know, what's the next biggest trend out there? And you know, you have McKinsey and consultants that go to them and say, hey, here's a report on that. But a lot of the things that show up in the report are not the things that are the things that people who actually know know. Like the 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 trend that we have today of of men wearing sneakers, where do you think that started? Right? That's not showing up in the McKinsey report. The point is just like the stoplight in, in New Hampshire and it, right. The, the know-how that you bring to the table is what you're ultimately going to, to make people look at your price a different way. Almost like if you don't do it, you're one of many and you say, okay, there's the high price, the middle price, the, the low price, the zero price, right? All these, let's say 10 solutions, or there's one over here by themselves and here's the other nine that are competing with each other on price. We have a question, Michael, sure. uh, from Kim, uh, from Kimberly. It says, so how to uh, just bring it down. One second. So how do we get a sense of what would be valuable to the decision maker? Great question. Um, what I would say in this day and age for every decision maker, you have to align to great pleasure or great pain, right? You have to figure out for the person across the table that's making the decision, what really makes them go, wow, that's great opportunity or wait, what makes them go, wow, that's great risk, right? And for every buyer, it's a little bit different. Okay, for these healthcare buyers, it was that they were gonna implement a product that was really going to put them in a position where they could really cause a problem. Okay, so you have to think about, and this is a hard thing to do because we look at our customers and we go, um, you know, she should change those shoes with that dress that they're not implementing the accounting system the right way. They're not launching the product the right way. They need more tutoring for their kids, like whatever your business. We know what the gaps are and the gaps are very obvious to us, okay? But remember, everybody, every one of our competitors is throwing out the same messaging to them. We can help your kids be better students, right? Everybody is saying that same thing. So what you've got to be able to do is you've got to be able to say for your buyer, you know, what causes them pleasure and pain and then how your unique insight and know-how delivers that for them. I can tell you, for me personally, if somebody doesn't do all of those things, I don't, wouldn't even notice it. If somebody sends me a note on LinkedIn that says, hi, we both have feet, so we should connect, like, because we both have feet, right? Uh, people say to me all the time, I understand we're all in the health and wellness business, uh, okay, right? You have to be able to understand that for that person, you know, what causes them um, great success or causes them great risk, right? Not just a little bit of risk, right? But great risk. And how does your know-how, because if you said, I know these are the risks you have and you shouldn't do this. And then you say, I do the same thing that everybody else does. I, I still haven't won the day. So I'll give you another example. We, when we were deploying these reward programs back in the day, we were doing some things for, for Citibank and, and we were doing it in one region of the country. So we were a smart young company and we called up Citibank corporate and we said, Hey, Citibank corporate, we're doing this across New York and New Jersey. You guys are, we're giving out incentives to employees for healthy behavior and we can help you automate the whole thing. And Citibank corporate said, 
we don't really care. Every region does their own thing. We're not going to get involved. We have enough fish to fry. And we're like, no, 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 hold on, wait a minute. We're, we're doing this thing. The system's implemented. We already have a contract. Like you just throw it. And they're like, nah, we, you know, we're a bank and we got bigger fish to fry. And we're like, wow, that's really weird. There's value here. It's easy. Like we already have a contract with them. Like, and a couple of weeks later, there was an article in one of the payroll magazines. And the article was basically that one of the big consulting firms for any of you had friends that have been consultants, you back in the day, pre COVID people would travel to, you know, a town and they'd stay, they do a consulting gig and they'd live there for, you know, basically every day and they'd be away from their families. And so at the end of these consulting gigs, managers would give them incentives. They would give them, here's a thousand dollars for a gift card or whatever it may be. Right. And they weren't taxing them, right? This big consulting firm that you would know that also had a big tax practice basically got fined millions of dollars by the IRS because when the managers were giving away these incentives, they weren't keeping track of them. They were just like, it was some in budget somewhere and they weren't taxing them. So there's a big article in a payroll magazine. So we went back to Citibank and we said, Citibank, we'd like you to look at this. And they're like, well, why should we? And then we're like, you guys are all going to jail. Because all across the country, you have managers and bank branches giving away like gift cards and, and you're not taxing any of it. You don't even know what's going on. And read this article about this big fortune, whatever company. The next day they picked up the phone calls. Why? Because we were talking to great pleasure or great pain, right? And we were showing how our unique know-how, right? Was gonna solve that problem. Okay, remember, we, we knew what was going on in their branches before they did. Okay. Sorry about that, Michael. We had a, another question from Barry Anderson of how much should research on the competition play when considering my differentiators? Yeah, what I would say is research of your competitor is just what you need to get on the ride, right? You need that as a foundation to understand how things are done. But what I can tell you is that because you face competition from different places and because everybody's willing to give um, stuff away from free, it's ultimately your know-how and potentially even you know, packaging it up a different way than your competitors is ultimately what wins. So you wanna know that as a foundation, but that doesn't mean you, you follow the same approach. Um, the, the analogy that I've give, given a couple of times before is the Super Bowl ad from Budweiser a couple of years ago, where it's like a medieval times ad where somebody, you know, this chariot gallops up to the castle and knocks on the, the Budweiser castle. And they're like, we're here to deliver your corn syrup. And Budweiser's like, no, 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 you must have it wrong. We don't use corn syrup. You, you're gonna have to gallop down the road to Coors Light or Miller's Light, Miller Light. Now, I don't know about you, but I never knew beer had corn syrup. I certainly didn't buy or didn't buy beer because it had corn syrup, but Budweiser picked a criteria where they win, even though it was a criteria where nobody even cared. Now the next day, the criteria for buying beer and not buying beer all of a sudden was does it have corn syrup, right? So the point of that is to say, you always have to research your competition to, to understand the foundation of how other people do it don't feel like you need to do it the same way, right? People bought the same stuff you get in things that in a store that now people deliver you curated packages of clothing that you just get to pick from. It was the same pair of shoes. It was just delivered to a, to a different way. What I would say to you is you can't just, you can't just put different sprinkles on an ice cream cone that already exists. You got to Again, different topic, find a playground where nobody else is playing or bring a know-how to the table. If I went today and tried to do incentives in healthcare, remember it's everywhere now, right? Um, most, let's say it was a technology investor. They would say to me, yeah, it's everywhere. Like people do this now, it's in every company. What I would say is there's, there's 10 things that if you do wrong, that if you don't do these, these things well, you'll never be successful. And they would be like, what are they? I'd be like, that's why you give us your money, right? So it's not about the thing, right? And, and I know what everybody's saying. It's like, what do you mean it's not about the thing? I've been spent my whole life on the thing. I burned my life savings on the thing. I love the thing. I wake up in the middle of the night because of the thing. It eventually is because of the thing, but I gotta make you pay attention first. And when you pay attention and you bring that know-how to the table, 
it changes how people think about your price, right? And, and if, they, if they see that, and again, I'm trying to take it out of the normal cliche of you got to provide value and a unique selling proposition. I mean, who doesn't do that? You've got to make people go, I didn't know that. I didn't know about that stoplight. And then you go and ask the next vendor, hi, I'm about to do a program in Marble, New Hampshire. Can, can you tell me what the traffic's late? And they'd be like, yeah, you know, there's traffic, there's stoplights, and they never mention the stoplight. And you're like, they don't know. Okay. Well, the price you get is relative to the know how you communicate. Tafair, did, did you have a, uh, other questions or is that? I know it seems oh, but feel free, guys, to speak up if you have any questions. We are taking audio does questions. Anybody, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry. I thought I missed a couple. Um, does anybody have a particular pricing challenge that they're thinking about for their business? Man, everybody has pricing challenges because we all think that all these issues affect us uniquely, right? But does anybody uh, been really kind of struggling with how to package or price their, their product or service that maybe we could comment on relative to what I was just talking about? I, I actually have something. Hi, good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? My name is Victoria. I have something unique and different because I am now starting to tap into the consulting arena. Mm -hmm. um, my company is a con uh, environmental slash construction company. Um, and now we're toggling into clean energy with renewables and energy efficiency service providing. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I have is valuing my consulting, even though I give it away for free. How do I stop giving it away for free and monetize it um, when I get those calls? Hey, I have a, a project, um, you know, and I need some help to find out how I can implement these, these energy efficient um, services, renderings, and things of that nature. Because for me, it's like time is time is valuable. So if I happen to take out some time to um, speak with you for 45 to two hours, um, I'm missing out on other opportunities to monetize for those hours. And I, I, I don't want to make it sound so cliche like, oh, yeah, you know, if you can't pay me 150 for this hour, then I don't need to talk to you about anything else. But I kind of want to use it as an in to get them to say, okay, well, we're going to consult with you on this um, particular project matter and then using that as a retainer. How do I do so in that sure. capacity? Great question. Victoria, where are you based? I'm in Chicago. Awesome. Um, so I don't know if you saw, but the, the regulations for a lot of the, what's coming down the infrastructure plan just came out. I don't know if you saw, they had these four, these four key bullet points about like compliance with these things. I don't know if you saw the stuff that just came down um, this week about it. Um, so what? So what I just said, Victoria, I just made up. Okay, and I made it up for a reason because the reason why people, you know, take your service and take your value and don't pay you for it is because of what we were talking about in terms of before and know how, right? You, what you've got to be able to do in the way you talk to them, and you need to be able to do this in a half hour, right? Is to make them go, oh, wow, she really knows stuff we don't know. And then that becomes the basis for the conversation about hiring you, right? Um, if you just walk them through a process, tell them about the service, tell them what you're going to do, tell them you're going to help them. The reason why you don't ever get to cut that off is because you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, right? What you've got to be able to show them and you got to get good at this, right? Is, wow, she really understands this in a way that we don't. And therefore is going to, again, what I said before, cause us a lot of pleasure, or a lot of pain. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, and for me specifically, what I wanted to focus on was providing um, strategic, sustainable solutions for some of the challenges um, in this particular niche and market, because I do touch so many different facets of it. Um, so really trying to 
get that to that point where I can provide strategic solutions for the problems that they have with a particular project or a policy. So especially because this is evolving and new and going to continue to grow, what I would say is, if I were to start a business like yours without all of your capability, I would say things like, I want to have, I'm providing you strategic, sustainable solutions for green, this, that, and the other thing. Okay. So I would say the same thing that you just said. What you need to do is what we said before is you got to go back and find those three things that they can't be cliche, that are the actual pieces of know how that put kind of meat on that bone. So somebody goes, oh, that's what that means. Okay. So, for example, like rebates and incentives, um, uh, sure. where some be- tip dollars might be. Yeah, okay. and, and be as esoteric as you can, because it, if if I were to go read an article on it and put five bullet points together and they said rebates and incentives, okay, yeah, you're going to provide that information, but but it's almost got to be even more, you know, esoteric than that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Another Another level down. Right. So I know many of the women on the, on the call today are, are, are moms, right? So somebody comes into you and says, well, Hey, listen, I know you're, you're, you know, we've had this at home learning and we provide tutoring services and, and everybody says, you know, probably the same thing. It's the one that's going to really talk to about really having a true understanding of what's going on with your child at age X or Y, right. Where you're going to go. Yeah. That's the person I want. Okay. But it can't just be the normal cliche stuff. Ah, your kid's staring at a zoom all day long and doesn't have it. Like it can't just be that because that's what everybody else says. You've got to be able to show that next level of insight, right? That sets you apart. Because remember, everybody else is just going to do that first layer. That's what everybody else is going to do. Okay. What you've got to do is pull into your own know-how. We all have it. Every single one of us have it because we've been in our businesses. We've been in what we're doing. We know. We just have to make that insight, not the normal cliche bullet points. Okay. It's got to be that next level of know-how that says, I know the stoplight. I know Marlboro, right? I'm the person you should hire. Okay. And Victoria, your service is obviously complex and sophisticated. Um, but, it, but, but again, it's um, buyers don't, I remember, I'll never forget it. We used to fill out these hundreds of pages of RFPs, requests for proposals for these big health plans. And years later, one of the, one of the people that was on the other side of the health plan, we became friends and, and she's like, we never read them. I think they're hundred page proposals from five different vendors. We don't really actually ever read them. So what you realize it was these themes, like these just ideas that, man, they're different. And why are they different? Well, you're giving me insight that causes me great pleasure or pain. Like that's, that's why people pay attention. And that's why products and services get priced the right way. Now, what you may say to them is you may say, hey, listen, um, and this is an important point because I want you guys to leave with this concept, but then there's other things that you can do that I want to talk about for the rest of the time that is, is important. Um, when you go into it with, and you lead with the know-how, then structure and process is really important. Okay. Um, let me stop for a second. Cause I know people, a couple of people are raising their hand. Does anybody have a question? Okay. Sorry. Um, so we've come in with know-how somebody has a perception of us and then we're, then what you really want to be able to have is really good structure and really good tools, right? So that means how do you price? It's this, right? You get, we'll use Victoria's example. You get an hour of free consulting and that free consulting, we do this. That's where your know-how comes out. And then here's how the pricing works. Here's how, here's how the process works, okay? The more you leave that open, um, the less sophisticated we seem, the less organized we seem, Right. If you think about the great retailers, great retailers make packages easier for you. Okay. And, and what should go with that, that standardization. Okay. Um, should be 
tools and information that explain it in a very consistent way. Okay. So, so what does that mean? Let, let's say you're, you're selling a product and service and it's a technology product and somebody says, well, what's the reporting like? Well, what reporting do I get out of this technology as an example? One thing you could do is you could say, you could answer it, send an email saying, hey, here's the answer to it. Or you could have a really tight reporting section on your website and a little one pager on reporting that you send them that consistently delivers that message. Because remember, they're going to go back to their day life, right? They're going to go back and a week or two weeks later, they might look at it. So, so the know-how coming in and then the, the standardization of your pricing and the standardization of the, of the tools that explain the different pieces of it. So you make it easy for them to, easy and consistent for them to kind of learn and understand. I think Ariel had a question. Sure. Ariel? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry about my background. I am at work and I'm a construction worker, so it does get loud a little bit. Um, but my business is at Open T, and I had a question on pricing because I have a very high end product. Yep. And um, I was told before that maybe I should lower my prices to compete. But then my whole attitude was, well, I'm really not trying to compete with the other tea brands because those other tea brands, they will always be who they are, you know, cheap tea, crappy tea, whatever it is and they have nothing else but to offer is tea. Um, but my tea has stories from families. My tea is in 100% home compostable packaging. Um, I plant the tree with every purchase. I provide free eBooks on how to help people be environmentally friendly in their daily habits. So I provide a lot more um, awareness and education than the average tea brand does as well as um, more transparency so i don't know if you have looked at my website or have or have not looked at my prices before but um what would you say to something like that when someone tells you to lower your standard so great question um two different things i would say um you know a lot of us you know who have ever purchased Starbucks before pay more for our coffee, right? Right. Why? Why? I think more so because it's a social status versus the quality, because I, I've noticed that people who want a quality cup of coffee do not go to Starbucks. Right. Do, and you, the, do you get what I mean? Like the actual coffee connoisseurs who appreciate the coffee and how it's roasted, they don't go to Starbucks. Right. And in the beginning, it wasn't a social status. Right. So the point is that there are lots and lots of organizations out there that, that charge a higher price. Usually it's not about just the making of the product or the service, right? There's in Starbucks, obviously it was a whole experience and now that train has left the station. So what I would say is this, number one is, again, there's always gonna be cheaper tea. Right. right? Um, it is what you weave around that experience, right? That makes people pay more for it. In Starbucks back in the day, it was like, come have your meetings here, right? It, back in the day, they wanted you to go there and just hang out and not even buy anything. And so people pay $4 for a cup of coffee and where they should have paid two, right? right. So. So it's what you put around it, right? Sometimes if you have a higher price service, you have to put other services and packaging around it. The other is who you're selling to, right? If you told me that you wanted to sell to the, the middle of the bell curve, right? People with low to moderate income, um, but you want to sell mass, that's different and a different price and a different packaging than if you, have, uh, you want to sell to high end. Folks, one of the things that we we encourage people to do in the midst of COVID, I, I remember doing this with some women down in, in Houston who had, who had a, a hair salon specifically for black women. And they're like, our, you know, our clients aren't coming in, whatever people are, are challenged financially. And I was like, well, why don't you try selling to a different group of black women? Mm -hmm. Let's go sell to black women that that the money isn't an issue. You may not have sold to them before. But now you can, and to that women that the, in that particular case, the price wouldn't matter. So 
I think part of it is the value you put around it. And part of it is who you're selling it to. If you want to sell it to a, a large part of the population, you know, the higher your price, the tougher it is. But if you're saying, well, listen, for me to hit my goals, I need, I need a hundred customers a month. And those hundred customers a month, I want to pay the high price. I just have to go after the hundred customers with my sales and marketing that are more likely to pay that price. Right. Yeah. I'm definitely not trying to go for the medium. I understand that I have a niche market and a niche product. Um, I guess I just wanted to hear your insight on it because I don't talk to too many people about it and I don't get too much of um, different perspectives on it. So I just want thank you for your insight because I have been so stuck on like, no, if I lower my standards now, then people are always going to expect me to lower my standards. And I know my product is a high end product. And I mean, like, if you go to my website, like I tell you how to pair it right away with different wines and how to pair it with dinners that are vegan and non-vegan. Like if you go to any other tea website, they don't give you nothing. They just say, this is a tea, you buy it, you don't, you know? And I give educational, like, you know, I put so much into it. Yeah, so as you guys can probably tell, this is more chess than checkers. It's not one linear thing. If I, if I increase or decrease my size price, there's no magic answers. There's, think about how many times we've interacted with somebody, something, and one person will say, wow, that's way too expensive. And somebody else will say, wow, that's really cheap about the same product, right? right. It, it, it's all what you put around it. And it's also who you, who you sell it to, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you another example. I was on the streets of New York years ago and coming out of a restaurant and sitting in a chair was a woman in her maybe early 20s who was sketching. And she was sketching you know, the portrait of somebody who had sat in front of her. Right. So typical New York, you sit down, I sketch a photo of you and she was getting paid 20 bucks to do this. And it was unbelievable. In 10 minutes, she's going boom, boom, boom. And like every single, I was like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? And she's like, that's what we get paid. And I was like, you can really just sit there and draw some. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, and it was a, a restaurant that opened up into the street. So it had like a bar in the street. And I was like, can you draw that? And she's like, sure. And she goes and draws like every liquor. Bar. I was like, oh my God, like this is, so I'm like, you should go to every major investment bank and law firm and walk in there to the office manager and say, I will draw something for free for you for 30 minutes, whatever you want. And then you're going to hire me to, and you're going to pay me $10,000 to draw whatever you want me to draw. And these days she makes, I think last year, she made, last year she made $700,000. So wow, the, point, the point is that, that to the guy on the street who went up to her and said, I'll, you know, I'll charge you 25 bucks she would have, they, the person would have said, no, that's too expensive. Everybody else charges $19.99. <laughs> right, right. It, it's always that, it's always that finessing, you know, or trying to, yeah. yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And, and, and who, and who you're selling it to, right? JP Morgan could not care less, right? About, right, the price, but the, the person on the street did. So, so part of it's the value. If you're, if you have a higher price, you need a higher, how you higher value story around it. Um, sounds like you're doing some of those things and you just have to make sure selling it to the right person. We have one more question from uh, Rose, uh, just hourly rate versus packages. And if you should have a, a multi-tiered approach to pricing. Um, what Rose, where are you based? What kind of business you have? Hi, um, good afternoon. I'm in Florida. Um, so I have an engineering and tech solutions consulting firm. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of struggled with um, what's the best approach for pricing um, because as a consultant, like uh, my first, like I, I just signed a contract um, and I've worked in, so I've worked in government, um, like government contractors. So I'm uh, used to actually using that hourly rate. Yep, the schedule, yep. Yeah, to do proposals. And yep. so I just signed my first like major uh, client um, and again, used an hourly rate for that. Yep. Um, but um, I want to also target um, commercial uh, customers yep. and also um, small businesses. That's, that's actually, you know, one yep. of the reasons why I started this because I want to help uh, small businesses. But for them, 
I'm wondering, okay, do I do an hourly rate or do I do a pre-packaged? Because some small businesses, I think the pre-packaged option um, would work better for them. And so now I'm thinking, okay, do I just have, you know, a, a multiple uh, options and, and then just apply what works best for, you know, that given client? Um, great, great question. Um, and I learned a lot about this in my healthcare business because we would sell the health plans and we'd say, hey, you get this package and inevitably they would say, but wait a minute, I think I got the, I thought I was supposed to get this. I thought I was supposed to get this. I thought I was supposed to get this. So that's, exactly. so here's what I would say, the, the where I've landed on this. And again, if you're selling into, you know, the GSA schedule and you have to do hourly, I mean, sometimes you have no choice, but if you're given a choice, what I would say is this, create a package that includes a certain number of hours, okay. right? So say you're going to get for $5,000, you're going to get this and it includes this number of hours. And if you go over those hours, it's X per hour. Okay. And that way you can put a box on it, right? People can understand, okay, I get what I get, but it also includes a certain number of hours. So for example, if you went to a small business and you said, we're going to do your taxes, right? And you said, okay, we're going to do your taxes for $2,500 and you go in there and it's a complete mess, mm -hmm. right? you'll end up spending a lot more and you end up, so to go in there and say, we charge $2,500, this includes this amount of hours of work because in a normal situation, even with some things that are screwy, um, that's what it would cost. And we'll communicate with you, you know, along the way. And then if somebody says, well, the package just might be a lot. And then said, listen, we could negotiate a bigger package, but we always are tracking hours and making sure we're staying on track because there's a lot that we don't, we don't know. And then you just set the package you can have a bunch of packages where the hourly, the number of included hours is just different based on how many, um, how big of the dollars are. Okay, and and so um, one of the things I encounter a lot is um, um, with the services I provide, um, most times the client will come in with their thought of what they need. They see what's available or what I can provide them and they kind of want more. So, um, or they make um, different change, changes. So to um, consider or, or should I, should in, the, in those packages, should, should I add in additional hours for scope creep? Or should it just be, hey, we're sticking to these hours. And then if they go over, then that's an additional, um, that's an additional, you know, fee or, or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's exactly what the hours do. They prevent scope creep, right? Okay. Because if you say this is this package for this number of hours, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, you're not learning, you know, when it's meeting one and meeting two and meeting three and you're into it and you realize, wow, this is, this is bigger than a bread basket. Mm -hmm. You're communicating about that earlier. Gotcha. Um, the hours is this objective, you know, we used to sell to these health plans and Signal would be like, wait a minute, we thought that for a hundred thousand dollars, we got the New Orleans Superdome. And we're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, you know you didn't get that. It's just that you don't have anything objective like a number of hours. So the gotcha. so number of hours can, I think, really help. And then you get into the appropriate dialogues if you want. If you said, listen, we think we're going to need this and this, and it's great. I'll add hours and I'll add price and go. I, that's my suggestion. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, man, these hours go so fast. Um, I hope uh, this was really valuable for everybody. A um, couple of housekeeping things. As you all know, a lot of this stuff is in the learning community. Um, feel free to ask your questions. I know um, our team here passed along the survey. Please, if you get a chance, um, they'll put it in the chat. Please make sure you complete that. That survey is just another way for us to learn the things you need, the things you have, um, you know, that you have on your mind that we can, that we can try, to, uh, try to help you with. So, to fair, anything else or are we... Uh, send people on their Friday afternoon. We're good. We'll give them, I guess we're right up against the hour. So thanks so much everyone for joining us. Your questions and interaction were amazing. Feel free to spread the word. This is a free call every week. So, you know, uh, spread it to your friends and family uh, as needed. So thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. <laughs>